Hi, I'm Glenn Rogers, and this is Biblical Insights. Our video today is about what God did for you. And I guess you could say what God did for all people. The text we're going to be thinking about is from Paul's letter of Colossians, that is, the people who were Christians in the city of Colossae. And so when Paul wrote to them, we called that letter Colossians. Chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. It's a very important text. He says a lot of really important things about God and Jesus and reconciliation and salvation and sin and just gives us a, a good overview of a lot of very important things about Christianity. So we're going to be reading the text from my translation of the New Testament, uh, the Simplified New Testament Study Bible, and it's also a commentary. Uh, so let's read what Paul has to say to the Christians in Colossae. Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. He has authority over all created things, for he is the one who created all things. Everything in heaven and on earth, things that can be seen and those that cannot, including the powerful spiritual beings who exercise authority, were created by Jesus to serve him. He existed before anything else, and it is through his power that all other things continue to exist. Jesus is the head of the body, the church. He was the first one to be brought back to life, never to die again, so he could take his place above all the things he created. It pleased the Father to be fully present in the world, in the person of Jesus. And it is through Jesus that God brings all people back to himself, repairing the relationship they broke when they chose to sin. God has made it possible for all beings, human and spiritual, to be brought back into a right relationship with him through the blood of Jesus. At one time, you were separated from God. You were his enemies because of the evil, selfish lives you lived. But now, God has repaired the broken relationship between you and him by allowing Jesus to die for your sins. Because of Jesus' death, you are pure and holy, innocent in God's eyes. And you will remain innocent as long as you continue to be people of faith, as long as you stay strong, holding on to the hope you have because you believed the good news about Jesus. That good news has been preached all over the world and is what my service to God is all about. Now, as I said, this is, this is a lot of important theology in this text, and so we're going to spend some time seeing if we can unpack a little of this and, and, and understand what Paul uh, was saying to the Christians in the city of Colossae. I think the first thing we have to realize is, is you need to understand when, when you're hearing this read or when you're reading it out of your own Bible, this was written to Christians, to people who had already come to God in faith, who had already confessed their sinfulness, who had repented of their sins, who had been immersed for the forgiveness of sins. And so Paul is explaining to them what has happened. Uh, and, and it's true because the, it's past tense for them, because they have already become Christians, they have already been forgiven, and so forth and so on. Now, if you're not yet a Christian <clears throat> and you're reading this, that this is not past tense for you, okay? This, this is still something that might be or might not be true for you, depending upon what you do, whether or not you acknowledge Jesus as the Son of God and, and come to God in faith and confess your sins and repent and allow yourself to be immersed for the forgiveness of your sins. So you, you just need to understand that depending upon your current relationship with God, some of what is said here may be true for you, and it may not yet be true for you because you haven't yet become a Christian. But if you are a Christian, then this is true for you. And what Paul was doing was reminding the, the believers in Colossae what had happened, what God had done, and what was now true for them because of what God had done. And so if you're a Christian, it's also true for you because of what God has done. 
And so there, there are several points here that I, I, I think we need to really focus on and understand. And the first one that I, that I want to make uh, is that when we think about what God is like, and if we ask the question, what is, what is God like? I don't know. You can't see God. God doesn't often speak in you know audible tones so that you can hear him. So what, what is God like? Well, if we want to know what God is like, what we have to do is look at Jesus because Jesus is God living among us as a human being. Jesus is basically God coming down to earth and introducing himself and saying, hello, nice to meet you. I'm God. Take a look. This is who and what I am. This is how I am. Okay? So that's that's the first thing to understand that Jesus is God living among us. And so when we want to understand what God is like, all we have to do is read the Gospels in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we see God, God in action, God interacting with people, God caring about people, God loving people, God helping people, God forgiving people, God changing people's lives. Okay, all of that, all we need to, to learn about God is the life of Jesus. So we look at Jesus and we see God. Okay, so that's, that's a very important point that you, you need to remember. The second thing, and Paul says quite a few things here. I'm not going to talk about every one of them because that would take too long. But the second thing that I want you to, to take away with you from this text is that Paul is very clear about saying that when human beings chose to sin, when you chose to sin, okay, whether you're a Christian now or not yet, okay, but when you chose to sin, when you were old enough to know the difference between right and wrong, good and bad, and you chose to do something that God says, don't do that. I don't want you to behave in that way. That's not good. That's wrong. That's sinful. See, when you chose to do that, then you separated yourself from God. That's what sin does. Sin separates people from God. You see, just as the soul or the spirit or the mind leaving the body is what results in the physical death of the body, so when the, the person chooses to sin, that sin separates the person from God. Now, what I just said, a lot of people will think, well, wait a minute, death is when your your heart stops beating and your brain stops creating brain waves. That's when you're dead. What is all this stuff about the soul leaving the body and all that stuff? Well, okay, there are physical organs in your body that need to function in order for your body to continue to be animated. Your heart has to be pumping blood. Your lungs have to be working. You have to be breathing, right? You need to get air. And, and your, your, if your brain is getting the the oxygen it needs from the blood that's circulating, then it's functioning and you have brain waves that can be seen, you know, on a little electroencephalogram machine. You can see the brain waves and everything. Yeah, so there's physical life and, and as long as all the parts in there are working, then you're, you know, you're alive. But if they stop working, then you're dead. That's one way to think about death. Okay, and, and that's the way many scientists think about it and many doctors think about it. But uh, theologian and philosophers know that there's more to it than that, uh, that there is something in there, the, the you that's in there, the real you, your mind or your soul, your spirit, whichever you want to call it, that, that animates your body and, and, and makes you a special, unique person different from anybody else. And when that leaves the body, then the body's dead. Okay? Well, in the same way, when you're in a relationship with God, when sin enters in, then there's a separation. Uh, the soul, the mind, the spirit is separated from God, and that leads to spiritual death or results in spiritual death. Okay? Now, who's at, who's, who's at fault for that? Well, we are. Human beings are. We're the ones who know the difference between right and wrong and good and bad, and we're the ones who choose to do wrong. And, and so if we're separated from God, it's not that God left us. It's that we left God and went off to do something wrong, something sinful, something that we shouldn't have done. 
And, and so we, we need to understand who's really at fault here. A lot of people blame God. You know, why does God condemn people? You know, because they say, well, God doesn't send anybody to hell in the sense that he just made an arbitrary decision to send people away. People condemn themselves to separation from God when they choose to sin or when they choose to reject God's offer of forgiveness and grace and salvation. So, uh, you know, a lot of what happens in our relationship with God is our responsibility. Some of it is God's responsibility. Some of it is our responsibility. Well, what part of this whole thing of relationship with God was God's responsibility? If it was our responsibility for the sin that separated us from God, what did God do in the whole thing? Well, God became a human, came into the world to show us how to live and offer himself as a sacrifice of atonement so that sins could be forgiven. And, and Paul is talking about that here when he's talking about uh, God allowed Jesus to be sacrificed so that sins could be forgiven. Human sin requires human punishment and human blood to be shed. Jesus was the God-man or the God-human who offered himself for the sins of everybody else. You see, Jesus didn't sin. He was the perfect human being, never sinned, never did anything wrong. And he offered himself as a sacrifice in place of everyone else. And, and God said, yeah, sure, we can do it that way. So God offered a sacrifice so that sin could be forgiven. Who did he offer? Well, he offered himself in the person of Jesus. Who was the sacrifice to? Well, it was to God. God, Paul talks about this in, in Romans chapter three, how that, and we made a video on that already. You can go, go find it, but uh, uh, you know, God offered himself to himself as a sacrifice so that his anger at sin could be assuaged or his wrath could be appeased and then sin could be forgiven. So when each individual comes to God and says, I'm sorry, I, I know I'm a sinner, I'm sorry, and, and I need to be forgiven, please forgive me. I'm not gonna live that way anymore. I'm gonna live differently, you see? And, and then you find someone to immerse you in water for the forgiveness of sins in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, or in the name of Jesus. Either either way, the Bible has both, both uh, terminologies there for, for baptism, then your sins are forgiven and you're added to the church. And Paul says, and this is important, you, you're, you're saved and you are pure and innocent and holy, right? The, the sin is taken away so that it's as if you never sinned. Isn't that great? It's, it, it's not just that it's this big, ugly thing that's pushed back into the background, but it's still back there somewhere. You see, that, that's not the way it works with God and, and with forgiveness. When God forgives sins, they're gone. It, it, it's like they never happened. They're completely gone. And now the judge declares you by banging his gavel. He says, not guilty. See, uh, we're innocent in God's sight because of the blood of Jesus cl cleanses us, washes away sin. And we're holy and pure as long, Paul says, as we continue to be people of faith, continuing to live the way we ought to live. What God has done for us is, is just amazing. We caused the problem. God stepped in and fixed the problem, at least potentially for every person. And all we have to do to take advantage of his fix, right, is acknowledge our sin and ask for his forgiveness. Assure him that we're going to try our very best not to sin anymore. We're going to, we're going to turn our lives around, try to live differently, and then be baptized so that our sins can be washed away. See, it's, it's a simple thing. It's such a simple thing, easy to do. And yet many people say, no, not interested, don't need it, don't care, don't want it. But for those of us who understand 
that our relationship with God is the most important thing there is, then we accept that offer. We let God forgive us, and and we enjoy then uh, an intimate and special relationship with God where we do not need to fear. We just don't need to fear anything because God is there, God's with us, and, and he's going to protect us and take care of us. Oh, bad things will still happen, sure. He's not going to you know, make our lives wonderful and perfect so that nothing bad ever happens and we don't have any more problems. That's, that's not the point. The, the, the point is whatever happens, he will be there with us to comfort us and encourage us and, and, and uh, give us strength and help us get through the challenges and the difficulties. Well, those are my thoughts for today. I hope you find them helpful and encouraging. Uh, I hope that at some point you might share some of these videos that you're watching with other people. Maybe leave some comments in the comment section below. That would be very helpful if you have questions to ask or something of that nature. We, we would love to hear from you. But I'll, I'll leave you with these thoughts. This is what I always say at the end of the video, so you already know what's coming if you've seen some of them already. Read your Bible, pray, go to church, and may God bless.